Wow. Well, church, grab your Bibles this morning and turn, if you would, to the launch of a brand new book as we continue on. We go from 1 Corinthians this morning to 2 Corinthians, the great letter of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. You might be thinking this morning, well, isn't it kind of, you know, it's it's addressed to the same people. Is it the same stuff, same topics, all that? No, not at all. We're looking at a message entitled this morning as we get into the introduction of it all. The title is rather lengthy, but I think necessary. It is this. This might be a little uncomfortable. The title. This might be a little uncomfortable. Why is this the title of today's message? Because it is about suffering. It is about hardship. It is about difficulty. It's about what God's Word says regarding us in reality being Christians on our way to heaven, but not there yet. And for now, in this life, there may be things that might be or become a little uncomfortable in our Christianity. We've all been to the doctor, and we know by now, after the second doctor's visit, that whenever the doctor says, this might be a little uncomfortable, you know it is going to hurt like the dickens. And you say, well, you're not encouraging me, pastor. That's right, but I am. Christianity hurts. It is uncomfortable at times. There are difficulties. Now, maybe for 99% of you guys here today, this doesn't apply. But, but listen, cheer up. Take notes, because someday it's going to apply. And... Uh, It's all important. By way of introduction, and and church, you can just relax this morning. We'll go as far as we can. My timer's going to go off. I'm going to quit when my my, uh, alarm goes off. You you won't be late today. I want to honor what God is going to say to this church today. I have my notes, but I want to be open to what the Holy Spirit has to say as well. By way of background, 2 Corinthians is known as Paul's unread letter. Mark that down. It shouldn't be that way, but in theological circles, the the book of 2 Corinthians is known predominantly among Bible students and scholars that it is Paul's most unread letter. It's understood to be the second least read letter in the Bible, uh, specifically the New Testament. The number one least read book of the New Testament is the one that should be read the most and that is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation says that it has built into it a blessing for all those who will read this book, and yet most people don't read the book of Revelation. Second book that is not read and should be is 2 Corinthians. Why? Because it is the book on how to maneuver, negotiate, and be prepared for suffering, difficulties. Listen, the word means stress, anxiety, Thus, this might be a little uncomfortable, that is, our Christian life, but with great hope and with great reason. It's also known as the most tender letter Paul ever wrote. It's a very tender letter in this sense that Paul reveals his heart like no other book that Paul has written. Paul reveals his feelings. Paul reveals his concerns, his cares, and his weaknesses. See, you and I have the tendency to put Christian leaders up on a pedestal and put them up and out of place above all the fray. I don't know why we do this. I could speculate, but we exalt Christian leaders to the point that somehow they just glide above life's troubles, that they don't have anything. And and I got to tell you something. Not only is that not true, But God will take his leaders and put them through the ringer to show publicly the power of his word. I got to tell you something. I grew up at a church where the pastor walked out to the pulpit and taught the word of God chapter by chapter, verse by verse, with a huge smile on his face. He had the ability to project into your life the love of God and all the while, With the joy that that pastor had in his heart, you began to think, if you weren't too much in tune with life, that boy, his life must be easy. Boy, his life must be cush. I guess, you know, he must, what does he do? He works one hour a week? I would smile like that too if that was my job. And you didn't know. And I remember sitting there in my mind after a while, you know, you kind of get tired of that big Chuck Smith smile. 
And I began to think, well, life must be easy for him. Little did I know, because I would think, well, if I were him, I wouldn't have done that. If I were him, I wouldn't have made that decision. And then God has a way of letting us in on things. God called me in the ministry, and now years later, I put my hands up in the air and say, God, forgive me, now I know exactly why Chuck did that. Paul reveals to us the difficulties of life and the reason why ministers and Christians and Christian workers don't convey to you the hardships is because the glory and the joy outweighs the pressure and the anxiety of the hardships. And you say, well, that's great for you guys, but no, 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 it's us. It's incumbent upon every Christian. The background to uh, 1 Corinthians is somewhat a little bit different. 1 Corinthians was written while Paul was in Ephesus to the believers in Greece. Not this time. Now Paul's in Macedonia, north of that region, north of the Aegean Sea, Macedonia. And he writes now, about 12 months later, after the first book, he writes now 2 Corinthians, and that would place it then in about the year 55 A.D. And so, uh, it is a, a region where he's writing from and writing to, obviously under Roman control. So look with me in the Bible. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and... We'll get into this. We'll look. Verse 1, Paul, mark it, an apostle, a messenger of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother to the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints who are in all Achaia or Greece. That's the region today. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Verse 6, now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or, if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation, and our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers, listen Christian, as you are partakers of the sufferings, plural, so also you will be partaker singular, of the consolation. We'll talk about what these things mean in a moment. Very, very briefly, we're not going to spend much time on verses 1 and 2. Paul is saying this. Notice this very quickly. He starts out the second letter to them. He says to them, Paul, make no mistake about it. It's me, an apostle of Jesus Christ. By what? By the will of God. This is, this is essential. Here's the reason why. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians... You, we just studied it at length. When they got it, some people said, excellent. Some people said, oh, that's what we're supposed to be doing regarding love or divisions, factions, or the gifts, or about carnality. Great. Some people read it and said, we don't like what he has said. We don't like Paul. We are now going to cast doubt on Paul's ministry. And during that 12-month period of time, there were those who were trying to undermine the authority of the Apostle Paul. Here's the amazing thing about Paul. He didn't care. He didn't care for himself. Church, listen. He didn't care for himself. He didn't, Paul didn't have banners. He didn't have to announce himself. He didn't have to somehow have an entourage that went ahead of him saying, Paul is coming. The Apostle Paul is coming. Coming this fall, the Apostle Paul. None of that stuff. You know, listen. He went and he preached and he taught and he did what God called him to do. Even in the face of his authority being rejected, he simply announces, the letters from Paul, deal with it, 
Whatever you choose to deal with it, I pray that you will obey the will of God. And oh, by the way, I'm an apostle by the will of God, not by the committee of men. This is a big deal. Well, we have, the church voted and we want to have pink carpet. Listen, Paul would have said, I don't care if the, I don't care, tear out the carpet. What do I care? But if somebody came along and said, Paul, we don't like your doctrine. We don't like your teaching. Paul would say this, you're making a grave mistake. I didn't make up the doctrine. I didn't think this up. This is from God. This is what Christ has revealed. And when you listen, this is awesome. Paul is saying, when you read what the Spirit of God used through my body to put on parchment, and you read it, you're listening to none other than the very will and words of Christ. It is an awesome thing. You say, man, that's bold. You bet he was bold. You bet he was bold. Do you want to know why he was bold? Because he knew his calling. He knew that God had called him to say and to do what he was doing. And listen this morning, you may be an architect, you might be an engineer, you might be a homemaker, you might be, I don't care what you are, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian pastor! Then listen, you are a Christian, a lover of Jesus, by the will of God. What does that mean? Wherever you go, is it in the home? Is it in the neighborhood? Is it at the office? Is it uh, at the city civic center? Is it on the construction site? Listen. What is your name? In the count of three, I want to hear your name. Shout it out loud. One, two, three. You are blah, the Christian, by the will of God. That means tomorrow when you get up and you go to work, you are going to do that because God has ordained that you be at that job. You say, I hate my job. Learn to love it. And learn to love it quick. Well, I don't want to be there very long. Love it as long as you're there. Love it for Jesus' sake. Shine like the heavens above. Just give it unto God. Button your lip. Put a smile on your face. Go to work and do it for Jesus. Even if you, even if you don't like it. Do it for God. Do everything. All that you do. Do to the glory of God. Why? Because it's the will of God for you in your life. Amen. You say, man, it's I can't even go to work without praying. Praise the Lord. I can't face that boss without reading my Bible. May it always be that way. (laughs) It's by the will of God. And settle this before we even ever get to the first point this morning. He mentions Timothy, his faithful companion, to the church of God, which is at Chino Hills. I'm sorry, which is at Corinth. With all the saints who are in California, I mean Greece. That's exactly what he means. Grace to you, circle the word grace, unmerited favor, charis. Unmerited favor, please, you're going to want to know this. You're going to want to remember this as we get into the study this week and next week. Unmerited favor is bestowed upon the Christian. Christian this morning, God has favored you. And this morning, listen, this is where we're going to go. We're going to answer these age old questions. Well, if God is a God of love, then why am I suffering? If God is a God of, of, of goodness, then why is there evil? If I'm a Christian, then why am I going through the stuff that the non-believers are going through? Because God has highly favored you. God has set his seal upon your life. God has placed his grace. Listen, none of us, believer, atheist, Theist, evolutionist, it doesn't matter what you are. Independent, Republican, Democrat. Doesn't matter what you are. In life, there's going to be difficulties, challenges, sickness, hurts, pains, financial struggles, tension, pressures, anxieties. We're all going to have those things. Listen, here's the tragic thing about the non believer they experience those things, and 99% of the time, they just go bitter. By the time they come to their old age or to their end of their journey, they're angry, bitter, cynical people. And Christians who experience the exact same thing winds up at the end of their life's journey being excited to enter into the kingdom of glory, having seen God do awesome and wonderful things. The word of God has come alive to them. They've decreased, but he has increased. Their outward man is perishing. Even this morning as their believers in this church on their last few hours, if they haven't died already before first service, they're entering glory. The great sun that shines like it's going to shine today, 94 degrees Today, with brilliant sunshine, what's it going to do? It is going to either, listen, soften things or harden things. 
The wax will become soft. The clay will become hard. If your heart is understanding the depth of the things that we're going to be heading toward in this study about suffering and anxiety and how am I going to make it through? I don't have a job, pastor. What am I going to do? Listen, you are going to be encouraged. What does this say? 2 Corinthians, a letter of what? Encouragement. Encouragement. Grace, God has favored us, and we're going to find out what that really means. And the peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Peace. This is not the word peace with God. We already have that. Paul uses a different word. He doesn't use um, that you can have peace with God. So, no, no, no. That's already been, The moment you come to Jesus Christ, you have peace with God now. There's no more war. You're not kicking against God. You're not fighting. You're not saying, uh, my will be done, God. My will be done. <laughs> You've surrendered all that. This is the peace of God that he gives to who? Amen. His kids. Amen. Are you, listen, are you a Christian this morning? Yes. Two things right from the get-go. I'm favored by God. God says so. Unmerited, unearned. Number two, available right now is the peace of God in all my life's circumstances. This is what Paul is saying. So here we go. This might be a little uncomfortable. First point, verses 3 to 4. The question is, where is God when it hurts? Will you write that down? First point, where is God when it hurts? Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any tribulation or trouble. That's an awesome word. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now look, verses three and four, honestly, you know me. We could spend the next month or two months on those three verses. They are pregnant with meaning. All powerful, and we need it today in our age. What's going to become of the euro? What's going to become of the dollar? What's going to be drill or no drill? Republican, Democrat. What's happening in the world? Peace or no peace? War or no war? Listen, I'm talking to you, and we're going to be talking to the Lord in this study, that it doesn't, listen, it does matter and it doesn't matter. We should always pray for peace. We should always pray. Be exercising righteousness. But listen, after we've done those things, we surrender, always surrender to the fact that in the midst of any storm, God has promised us his grace and peace. That's all important. Where's God when it hurts? I think you might already know the answer, but it's not what we often feel. Number one, jot it down. He's enthroned in heaven. You silly rabbit. What's with that? Of course Where's God when it hurts? Number one, mark it down. He's in heaven. Now watch this. If my emotions take over, he's in heaven. That's not close enough. <laughs> my emotions are governing and controlling. I'm not happy that he's in heaven. I want him sitting right next to me. I want him holding my hand to the doctor's office. Well, hang on a second. The first thing that you and I need to settle is that God is enthroned in heaven. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Circle the word blessed. God is enthroned in heaven above. He is above the fray. But listen, don't worry, he's not removed from it. But our source, that's the point, our source for the help that you and I need is deposited from heaven above. I'm sorry, you're so quiet. Is it because I'm yelling so much? I'm excited about this because I know where I'm going in this message and I need to control myself. We need to have the right understanding. Number one is this, in your suffering and your pain, God is enthroned in heaven. And what do we see regarding the life of Jesus? When Jesus walked on earth, what did he do? The Bible says he lifted up his eyes and he prayed unto his father. Jesus opened his mouth and said, oh, father, did he not? Did he not tell the disciples from now on, I want you to call father, God in heaven, Abba. If you're Italian or my granddaughter or grandson, you'll say Papa. Nearness, closeness, dearness. 
relational love. In your trouble, God is enthroned in heaven. And if it was good enough for Jesus to cry out to his Father in all of his trials, then it's good enough for us. Put that in your heart and mind right now. If Jesus from earth, when he was ministering on earth, cried out to his Father, and his Father led him, guided him, blessed him, and got him through, then he's going to do it for me. He's going to do it for me. You see, Pastor, you just mentioned somebody a moment ago that's dying. Well, clearly God didn't get it through or didn't come through for them. Hey, hey, wait, press pause on your DVD of lunacy. What are you talking about? You think that this earth is, is worth hanging around for? That it, it's, that's this is all that it is? Well, God didn't heal this person and then they died. And where did they go? If they're a believer, they went to heaven. Quite a healing, I'm thinking. Quite a healing. There comes a time spiritually you outgrow this body. It's time to go home. Though you've never been there before, your heart is longing to be there. He's the God that is residing in heaven. God is enthroned in heaven above. And when you pray, you're not praying to Blue Shield. You're not praying to Kaiser. You're not praying to some doctor. If you, if you do, meet the new believer counselors after service today. You need to meet Christ, man. You need Jesus. You're praying to the God of heaven and earth. And if Jesus prayed to the God of heaven and earth, then how much more do you and I need to pray? He's enthroned in heaven. That should bring us great comfort. The Bible says in Hebrews 5, verse 8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus, what is called the great kenosis. The Greek word meaning that Jesus, listen, only God can do this. Some of you struggle with the deity of Jesus. You just need to read your Bible. Jesus willfully exercised the doctrine of kenosis, which means he at any moment had absolute power of the God that he was, the Son of God, but he willfully chose to not use it at certain times. For example, if he was going to raise the dead, he picked up his power, exercised the availing of it, and rose that person from the dead. Then, when Jesus was... Um, Praying and saying, Father, thy will be done. You see, if he was God, why did he pray that kind of a prayer? Why was he struggling in the garden? The Bible answers it. Kenosis. He willfully laid down the available answer or the exercise of power because of obedience so that you and I would be encouraged 2,000 years later. Do you understand the power of that? By the way, I just gave you the definition of mercy. I mean, not mercy. No, not grace. Yes, meekness. I, I got the M right. Got that part right. <laughs> meekness. Meekness is having all power to do something and you don't do it. He could have picked up at any moment and not learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Jesus, why did he do that? That you and I might be encouraged because there was a father in heaven enthroned and Jesus leaned upon his heavenly father while he was in this earthly world. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 says, Jesus came and spoke to the disciples, saying unto them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And you think about that for a moment. This is right before his ascension, obviously. He was God of God. He had always had authority. But this time it was different. He was the resurrected Son of God. And he looked to his enthroned Father, which is in heaven. Why? As a model. Where's God when it hurts, my friend? He's enthroned in heaven. It says in verse 3 that he's the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. How much? All comfort. The word means that he's the originator of mercies and the originator of comforts. All comforts. Mark this down. This is exciting. This word, comfort, you'll see translated numerous times in the Bible, and so you should. There is the Greek word paraklesis, which means this, that we are comforted with a consolation or exhortation or entreated. God would console, paraklesis. Then there's the Greek word parakaleo, which means this, 
to come near to me, to come near to the wounded one. God comes near, para kaleo, para, alongside, kaleo, to come and bring himself alongside. Listen to this. It means that he not only comes alongside, but he invokes, he invites, he desires, he entreats. Why is this important? Because the root word to these two words I just gave you, paraklesis and parakaleo, is this word parakletos. Why is that important? The word parakletos means to intercede, to be the comforter, to be the advocate, the one that consoles you in all of your difficulties. The word is pregnant with meaning and it applies to all areas of our life, but it comes from one individual. Listen to this. John 14, verse 16. Jesus is getting ready to leave. He's getting ready to go back to heaven. And in John 14, 16, Jesus said, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another. There you go. Para. There you go. Para alongside. Paracletus comforter. What will he do, this one? This one that is to be para alongside to comfort me. What will he do? He will console you. Listen, he will be the one who will say to you in your daily living and in your life, life's troubles, if you're listening, he's always speaking. You got to be listening. The situation is not for your destruction. He'll say, the situation is not what you think. The situation is not what you imagine. The situation, it, listen, is completely manageable. I've got a plan. It's not an incident. It's not an accident what has befallen you. I have given you the parakletos. Watch this. John 14, keep reading with me if you would that he may abide, he, personal pronoun, he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you orphaned, Jesus said. I will come to you. Right now, today, 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, not your emotions, Jesus Christ is near you believers at every moment. But emotionally, he's never more near to us. He can't get any nearer. But emotionally for us, the awakening comes to us that God is near us in our darkest, most challenging moments. Why? Because the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, not only walks with us every day, he's been with you and shall be in you. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit from the inside out will speak to us. I'm with you, Jack. Don't worry. I got a plan here. There's a reason for this. Don't panic in the midst of your situation. Don't panic. And how many Christians today panic? We panic. And it displays our lack of faith in God. It displays our ignorance of the word of God. Do you worry? Do you panic? Do you fret? Are you filled with anxiety? Jesus is saying to you, listen to my word. And the Holy Spirit is saying, listen to my word. And the spirit of God from the inside of you out brings to remembrance the things that you've ingested of the word of God. He wants to lead you through all of your life's challenge. Where's God when it hurts? Second thing, look at verse 4. Where's God when, where it, when it hurts? He's where the trouble is. He's where there's trouble. Verse 4 says, who comforts us in all our trouble or tribulations. It's the interchangeable word. The Greek's the same word. Tribulation, troubles. Same word. You got troubles? Anybody, anybody got troubles? A lot of people didn't raise their hand in here. So the rest of us are going home with you today. If you ain't got troubles, we're going with you. Troubles. You see, well, I didn't raise my hand because I didn't know what kind of trouble. All troubles. This is encouraging. I got to tell you. Man, I read this this week. In fact, I got to tell you something. Studying for this message this morning, Lisa kept asking me at home, why are you so quiet? I'm just thinking. But why? What's up? I'm just thinking. I didn't want to get into it. I didn't want to talk about it. Why? Because you know, it's kind of like a percolator. You know what a percolator is? It's just kind of sitting in there bubbling up from time to time. And it's heavy stuff for me. Because you know what? 
as a pastor here and having a pastoral staff, I hear about, all, I hear about troubles that are far greater than my troubles. This person's leg fell off. This person's baby died. This... And then I look at my own life and I ain't got troubles. That's my conclusion. Well, I'm not a, I'm not a worthy saint compared to the rest. But the Bible says all troubles. Meaning this, all of us are made with a little bit different of uh, constitution inside. And you may be going through a death or a sickness or a financial challenge, but somebody next to you may not be. And we have a tendency to judge issues by, boy, look at that one. And I must not be, a, maybe I'm not a Christian because I'm not going through the big stuff. No, listen, the word all troubles is all pressures, all sufferings, all anxieties of any type. So number one, in life, from start to finish, there's going to be tribulations and troubles. Understand this. Please change this way of thinking starting today. You may be physically blessed, but emotionally your life is one horrific, burdensome battle. And it takes everything of the word of God and your nearness to Jesus just to get you through each day. And I want to tell you, great shall be your reward in heaven. You may, have, you may be surrounded by, by emotional and personal support and gladness, but you're suffering through the physical pain and hurt of a disease or an injury. Great shall be your reward in heaven. God determines these things for us. No accident, no incident ordained of God. And we need to remember that. Where is God when it hurts? He's where the trouble is. In every issue of life, he's there. Unlimited, abounding in comfort for the suffering. The magnitude of the comfort will be an exact correlation to the magnitude of suffering. Church, get that down. There's no escaping this. Now watch, my goal is to get into your heart what God put into my heart this week. It may take a couple services though I take. The next thing is this, look at the end of verse 4. Where's God when it hurts? The answer is, he's here where it hurts. <laughs> he's here. He's in the place where there's trouble. He's enthroned in heaven. All that could be academic until I understand that God is right in the midst of our lives right now. If we are hurting, God is in the midst of our hurts. It says in verse 4 that we Christians may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble or any tribulation with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. What an amazing statement that is, church. Listen. Why does the Christian suffer? Because, listen... The non-believers are suffering. Why does the Christian suffer? Because other Christians are suffering. Why does the Christian suffer? Because Jesus suffered. Watch. Why does the Christian go through so much in this life? Because God, listen, is working in you and me the reality functionality of his living word that we may give God the glory. Amen. Watch, you might say, that's not good enough. Well, you need to take your heart to the woodshed of God and deal with that issue. Because here's the thing, church, listen, because I got I to gotta wrap this up. I promised you I'd stick, stick to time. It, listen, is there suffering in the world? Yes. yes. We want to be exempt. Think of that. Emotionally, we want to be exempt. We all understand that. But that's not real. Do we then throw up our hands in defeat and then conclude that we must be victims with a fallen world like everybody else? Nope. Why not? Because as long as God's on the throne... He's in the midst of trouble, and if I have a hurt, he's right there with me, 
And he comforts me through the hurt. People are watching me. Believer and non-believer. Family and non-family. They're seeing how we handle it. And so they should. Number one, from the eyes of the non-believing world, well, let's see how big his God is now, huh? And the world with a cynical heart, and I don't judge them for that, they look and they say, whoa, everybody else has gotten sick or gotten cancer or got their nose knocked off in this company, and now it's your turn. You're the one that's been preaching to us. Let's see what you're made of now, big Christian. Now, they may not say it, or in this culture, they probably would say it, but let's say they don't say that. It's in their hearts. And God says, listen, Jack, here's what I'm going to do. Watch everybody. We'll expound more on this next week. Detail. And I, I don't, I'm not saying bring somebody to grow this church. We don't need that. But if you know somebody in life who's hurting, they need to come next week. It's good news. Jack, I love you so much. Yes, Lord, you do love me enough, right, to keep me from hurt and pain? No, no, Jack, you know what? I appreciate what you're saying. I understand where you're coming from. But you have no idea that your very desire or request is literally destruction to your spiritual heart, soul, and life. What, God? Are you kidding me? But can't you just make me thankful and I'll be happy and I'll, I'll give you all the praise and glory. And he says to me, that's great and so you should normally anyway. <laughs> nice try, Jack. But the truth is, there are unbelievers in the world. And there are other Christians watching. There's new believers who, they don't know the power of my word and my ability to do something. And so like Job... Only those who are comforted by Job's writings are those who are suffering. Nobody goes to the book of Job when you're having a great day. Who needs them? Right? And so, Jack, here's what's going to happen. Now, because I am God, I'm enthroned in heaven, I'm... In the midst of trouble, it's where, I, I, it's where you can find me. God says, find me, go to the trouble, and you'll find me there. Yeah. That I'll draw the nearest to you. And it's only there, Jack, in that sweet spot. Where? You need to change the way you view suffering, Jack. You have been conditioned in your world to despise suffering, while my apostles ran toward it. Why is it, Jack, when you open up the Bible and you see them being beaten for being Christians that they run out of the courthouse in the book of Acts praising God because they were found worthy to be beaten for his name? Jack, don't you know there's a secret? You haven't got it yet. There's a secret, man. And it's my will to get this into your life that there is a suffering that in it and through it, can afford and purchase and allow only one thing. It's not earthly riches. It's not status. It's not influence. Jack, it is this, and are you happy with this? It is nothing more, nothing less than my sheer heart and character. You want to draw near to me, the road is suffering. When you suffer, and those who have are the only ones who can see me in that nearness where trouble is. Where you're hurting the most is where I will show you my robe pulled back a little more and the glory comes out. Moses, Jack, in his suffering, saw me on the mountaintop. Joshua, leading three million people, saw me in that place of fellowship and worship. David knew me in the midst of his fugitive plight in that dark and lonely place. Peter encountered me when there was a storm on the Galilee. You will never draw near to me when it is easy. 
You don't need me so much there. We are walking at times like that. I'm talking to you at times like that. I'm reminding you, thank me for the beautiful day at times like that. Jack, there's a dark day coming. And it's dark only because through the darkness, through the chagrin, through the perils, the greater the pearls, the greater the glory, the greater the outcome. There is no heaven without suffering. but I want it easy. You'll be in heaven. But in that day, you will have wished, oh, I would to God, I could have been a greater witness for Jesus. How does that come? Suffering. People will hate you. People will be attacked. People might hurt you for the cause of Christ. Are you willing to be a Christian above all other things? Are you willing to sign up and say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you? And then Jesus says to you, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. And listen, in that moment when Paul the Apostle, by the way, was in Corinth. We know this from another book. He was crying out to God. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Paul, be of good, be of good courage. I have many future believers in this town. I am with you. When did he call out? When he was in his darkest hour. Jonah called out from the belly of the great fish in his darkest hour. And church, I want to encourage you. Second Corinthians is a letter of encouragement coming from the heart of an apostle who was absolutely maligned for knowing Jesus. Your suffering is a gateway to glory. And I'm asking God, forgive me, Lord, for my previous prayers in my life. I'm asking you, Father, in Jesus' name, I trust your mercy and grace completely that when I say, oh, Lord, I want to be more like Jesus, conform me to the image of his will, that in that prayer, I've already relinquished the rights. I've already relinquished the trademark and the copyright of my life, and I say, oh, God, I trust you enough. You're not an animal. You're not mean. You're not angry. I trust you to do in my life and no further than what is necessary for my life to bring you glory. I embrace the suffering. And today you may be suffering and I want you to stop complaining about it. I say that lovingly. Stop griping about it. Ask God, God, in the midst of my suffering, no matter what it may be, all of our tribulations, all of our troubles, God, whatever it may be, I'm asking you right now to give me your heavenly perspective. Understand that I'm in trouble, and that's where you're at. And that you're in the midst of trouble, and that means you're in the midst of my life. So Jesus, in the trouble, make me more like you. And the Apostle Paul, in life, tasted so much of that glory of Christ that very few people knew. That when the believers were together, <laughs> a prophet, Agabus, showed up and took Paul's belt that he would wear around his waist. He took it, wrapped himself up in a prophetic display and said, whosoever belt this belongs to, this man shall go to Jerusalem and be arrested and bound and beaten and imprisoned. And everybody looked and they said, gosh, that looks a lot like Paul's belt. Somebody says, I gave Paul that belt. That, that is Paul's belt. Paul, they said in the book of Acts, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go. And Paul said, what do you mean by all these tears? I am both ready now to go to Jerusalem and be bound and to be killed for Christ. And everybody goes, oh, don't go. And it says in the Bible, we'll read it next week. When he could not be persuaded, that means they kept it up. Oh, 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 Paul, don't go. And they whine and they're... Paul said, put a sock in it. Don't you guys understand something? 
Um, I belong to the Lord enthroned in heaven, and I go where he says go. And if he says, watch, if he says go to Jerusalem, do you understand if I get arrested, if I get a flat tire on the donkey? It's all of God. I'm invincible until God calls me home. And so he goes, and he gets all of those things. They all befall him. Not once does he complain. Not once is he griping. Not once does he file, you know, a grievance. That event winds up leading him to preach the gospel to the emperor of Rome, of the world. What is the secret? They know something we don't know. When you get beat for Jesus, you rejoice. Hmm. If you're going to go to Jerusalem and get arrested and, and thrown in prison... It doesn't deter you. When the doctor says, you've got a lump here, you say, well, I understand that. Thank you, doctor. Do the best job, and I'll do everything you say. But Jesus has a lump here. Jesus has a lump here because I belong to Christ. My body's his. It's his temple. He's going to walk with me through this. So, doctor, before you get going, this is the God I serve. God will get you through. And if it gets you all the way through now, that means you'll be in heaven. (laughs) He didn't fail. He never fails. Father, we thank you for your truth. Each of us here this morning, we have our life's issue right here, right now. And Lord, I just ask as we just pause right now, Father, that the Holy Spirit would minister your touch to your people today. There are those hurting, their relationships hurting, their marriage, or their kids. There's no love or respect in the home, and that breaks your heart. And there's moms and dads, there's kids, they want that changed. That's pressure, that's tension. There's an answer in the midst of this. There's those that are physically sick. And we do obey the word of God. We pray now for divine healing to come upon them. God, that you would heal them. It's nothing for you to heal them now. We believe in all the miracles of God because we believe in God. (laughs) And if there's not a miracle written down and he wanted to do one, he can do that too. (laughs) There are those that are here today and they are so distraught with their situation or with their emotional, mental trauma in battle and that they have become so fearful or so sequestered, they become so burdened by the noise of doubt. And the Lord wants to heal you of that. He loves you. It is God's will that you receive the mercies from God, the God of all comfort, meaning through any situation that brings to you anxiety, temptation to worry, God is there. You give your concern to him. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. 